This video is sponsored by Skillshare, who I'll quickly take a moment to thank. And in case you haven't heard of them, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes. Uh, Marquez Brownlee recently did a class on there called YouTube Success Script Shoot and Edit with MKBHD, and it's just super well done. Even as a YouTuber myself, it was fascinating for me to see his process and learn ways I can optimize mine and learn more about actual videography, which I'm a total rookie at. And just with MKBHD's production value, and tone, I, I could watch him talk about anything all day and love it. Not to mention how this class would be even more useful if I was just starting out. Uh, Skillshare has no ads, there's always new classes being added, you can connect with other creatives through heaps of community features, it's just, it's just all around a great platform. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. Activision's handling of the 007 video game license was pretty bizarre. After acquiring the license in 2006, they first released a rushed but decent Quantum of Solace game in 2008 that was secretly a Casino Royale game that, by unconfirmed reports, sold quite well, which likely prompted Activision to invest more into bigger, better Bond games. The next two releases were 007 Bloodstone, a standalone Daniel Craig adventure for PS3, 360, and PC, and DS, uh, and a remake of GoldenEye for Wii and DS. For the longest time, talk of a GoldenEye remake was the stuff of legends, particularly about the Xbox 360 remake by Rare that was virtually finished but cancelled at the last minute. So when this Wii remake was announced, it drew eyes. I, I personally remember being super excited at the E3 2010 announcement trailer, only to moments later have my expectations tempered by exclusively for Wii being plastered across the screen. It wasn't exactly the go-to platform for FPS games. Still though, Activision marketing efforts framed GoldenEye as a blockbuster shooter with a deep multiplayer mode to honour the original game that allowed for GameCube or classic controller support, and had a bundled in gold controller version you could buy, almost as an acknowledgement that playing FPS games with the Wiimote wasn't exactly appealing or novel like it was with Red Steel four years earlier. Those kids that only had a Wii at the time probably felt quite pampered by GoldenEye. Activision first approached Free Radical to make this game, who, as the story goes, made a damn level prototype for 360 and PS3 in 2008, before the project fell through and Free Radical went under. Sadly, that prototype has never seen the light of day, but it would have been fascinating to see how Free Radical would have handled the remake, given their history with the original game. Uh, for those that don't know, Free Radical was formed by many ex-Rare employees that made Goldeneye. Activision's GoldenEye remake was then, at some point, handed over instead to Eurocom, a safe bet having developed a few well-made Bond games prior to this, including the PS2 version of Quantum of Solace, but they were certainly a smaller studio who made smaller games, which may be part of why this ended up on the Wii. This being a Wii game was actually, in a way, kind of refreshing at the time because third-party publishers didn't often focus on high-profile Wii exclusives. Uh, the main problem this release had was Activision suffocated it. Uh, it came out on November 2nd, 2010, the same day as 007 Bloodstone, the bigger budget game that, to no one's surprise, except maybe to the Activision executives, sold fewer copies than GoldenEye because, of course, it doesn't have the pull that something named GoldenEye has. Uh, not only that, but exactly one week later, on November 9th, Activision's very own Call of Duty Black Ops released, which was the biggest selling game that year. Uh, a week before GoldenEye, one of the most successful Battlefield games ever came out, and about a month before that, Halo Reach came out. If you wanted a new Bond game, you had two to choose from, and if you wanted a shooter, especially a multiplayer shooter, you had many clearly more polished games that you could pick up for the exact same price. Black Ops even had a Wii port if you only had a Wii. Uh, not to mention how many games in general come out at that time of the year, there were plenty of reasons to pass over GoldenEye. It really feels like Activision could not have released GoldenEye or Bloodstone at a worse time in 2010, and to release them on the same day was just baffling. Also baffling is then releasing a port of the game to 360 and PS3 a year later, GoldenEye Reloaded, which was immediately swamped by the likes of Modern Warfare 3, Skyrim, Uncharted 3, L.A. Noir, the works. Like, Activision made the same mistake twice. Uh, they claimed this port was developed alongside the Wii game, and if that's the case, which it may well not be, why not just wait to release the game as a major cross-platform release? 
Bloodstone could have had more breathing room releasing alone in 2010, then Goldeneye could have had its own limelight in 2011. And while the port does look a lot better than the Wii game, it doesn't hold a candle to any of the big budget shooters of the time, and it has frame drops on all platforms. I played the Wii and PS3 versions of the game for this video, and the PS3 version is what will usually be shown. Now I know I'm being a bit of an annoying editorializing armchair analyst here and maybe some of this is hindsight thinking but I feel it's necessary to frame just why this GoldenEye remake which could have and should have been jaw dropping news just felt like it flew under the radar entirely and while a lot of it can be put down to bad business decisions uh, the game itself could never have set the world on fire like the original did. From any angle you look at it the GoldenEye remake was an uphill battle for developer Eurocom. For England? For England, Alec. Always for England. The general consensus is that this is a Call of Duty game with a 007 coat of paint. Aim down sights, sprint, regenerate health, tactical and lethal grenades, one hit melee kills, all that good stuff. Uh, the opening dam level is the most Call of Duty of them all, as you follow Alec Trevelyan through like you would Captain Price. An opening flyover shot mirrors the original game until it flies over the back garage door to reveal Bond and Alec together, played by Craig and British actor Elliot Cowan rather than Brosnan and Bean. Uh, this was a talking point at the time, and it is a bit weird that Daniel Craig is playing Pierce Brosnan's Bond, but it's not at all surprising considering how licenses work, and particularly how the Bond license holders are. Uh, Craig does a decent, if a bit tired, job, and Judy Dench and Rory Kinnear return to to lend their voices too. Nobody ever died being too careful. Words to live by. You don't have the same freedoms you did in the original game here, like Alec commands you to go up the tower and take out the sniper and then you both hop on the truck as he drives and you shoot. It, it all feels very different to the less restrictive original and once you're past that opening courtyard it looks different too. Uh, as the game goes on it gets less and less concerned with recreating the original, often opting to be closer to the movie but different enough that you feel that it's just sort of doing its own thing with the same plot. It, it's not a game that revels in nods and winks, boldly changing levels and moments in what almost feels like an intentional move to avoid fan service. Except when it does occasionally revel in fan service. Uh, after Nicole Scherzinger covers the GoldenEye theme when the damn level ends, where she does a good job by the way, and it's a nice touch having a high profile artist do the song, uh, this game recreates the bathroom air vent thing from the original game where you shoot that poor dude in the head while he's on the toilet, which is a fun little reference, but then the rest of the facility layout is entirely different, which is a weird choice, assuming it was a choice with how restrictive this license was to work with. It's, it's such an iconic map that even the Quantum of Solace game recreated it, but this game didn't. That said, this single player version of Facility still feels quite old school from a game design perspective. After the first level, the Call of Duty-ness to this remake actually doesn't go too much deeper than the mechanics. Uh, there's a breach and clear moment here and there and the occasional big set piece, but once you aren't following not Sean Bean around, uh, the pace slows down to let you do secondary objectives or try sneaking through levels. There's often a few ways to get into a room, whether it's a vent or a window or a door, and a minimap shows how complex these levels really are. Uh, it's not like this all the time, mind you, but this game isn't always the endless corridors that you might expect it to be. There's plenty of opportunities to sneak up behind enemies and shoot out security cameras and use silences which the AI genuinely treat as silent because this is a video game. Uh, we've all played this before, like if you get spotted a few extra enemies spawn and once you clear the area everyone next door apparently had zero awareness of all the loud gunshots so you start the process all over again. And enemies will keep their back turned to you forever waiting for you to take them down. I mean, I mean look at these two, the building is burning to the ground and they're both just whacking desks with their guns, I guess. Secondary objectives usually involve taking a photo of something with your smartphone or hacking something with your smartphone because it's 2010 and smartphones are new and interesting and for the most part these feel like hidden object busy work tasks that are only included because the original game had secondary objectives. 
Eurocom's very own 007 Nightfire is actually the game I was reminded of most when it comes to this level design. Uh, not as railroady as COD, but not as open as the original GoldenEye. Slower and old fashioned, but not that old fashioned. Uh, it's also literally quite a bit slower than COD, as in movement speed is slower, which I assume is so Wiimote aiming can be more palatable, but when playing with a regular controller it does feel slightly off, especially on PS3 or 360. I could whip out the PlayStation Move and aim with that if I really wanted to, but I don't. One of the earlier levels is called Nightclub Loosely, and I mean very loosely, based on the scene in the film where Bond visits Valentine, where Robbie Coltrane is now a far less friendly beret-wearing tattooed man. Uh, for all its brilliance, something the N64 game failed to do is cohesively tell GoldenEye's story. Like, you can't follow what's going on without having seen the movie, especially when you do stuff that isn't in the movie, like whatever that silo level was. Uh, the remake does away with random levels like Silo or Cavern, and this nightclub level marks its first big breakaway from the original game as it isn't based on any old levels. At this point the game's been quite good at keeping you up to speed with what's going on with cool first person cutscenes and Judy Dench narrated briefings. The further in you get though, the more it falls apart. Uh, characters come and go without any time to breathe. You get none of the fun chemistry Brosnan and Bean had in the film's opening, and no character leaves a lasting impression. Even Xenia just doesn't have anything close to the chaotic energy that Xenia had, and only Trevelyan gets more than a few moments of screen time. Uh, Bond and Natalia kiss after what feels like a shared 30 seconds total together, and Alan Cummings' Boris, who could have brought some levity, isn't in the game at all. Uh, obviously none of these names mean anything to anyone who hasn't seen the movie or isn't a complete Bond's dork like me, but even on their own merits, these are bland, forgettable characters usually just popping into the game to yell things at you before leaving again. M's briefings get very sparse as the game goes on, which is a problem because they could have helped outline the plot, and while this remake is still far more followable than the N64 game, that's a low bar to clear because this still is not easy to follow, and it's frustrating that story beats don't hold any weight here because Eurocom could have clearly taken advantage of all the tech that the N64 didn't have. And just on that thought, it would have been nice to have been able to play as Bond during the car chase from the film, or ride the motorbike in a way that wasn't just a shooting gallery. If you're gonna be closer to the film, include more cool parts from the film. Uh, Bloodstone and Nightfire had fantastic driving sequences, and if any Bond was to go the extra mile and include them, it probably should have been the remake of Goldeneye. Uh, it does include the tank mission, but it's really quite bizarre. I'll talk about it in a second because it needs context. The nightclub level is one of my favourites. Its lighting and crowds are very atmospheric. The song playing in the background at the start is a mix of Dead Mouse's I Remember from DJ Hero 2, which is a nice touch and is very 2010. Uh, it's mixed in well too, being all reverby and club bathroomy. Uh, the sound design as a whole is noticeably good here, so good that it staged what I think is this game's finest moment. For all its explosions and saving the world and Bond bits, a simple shootout towards the end of the nightclub marks GoldenEye's most memorable moment for me. Uh, after you've blasted your way through dance floors and kitchens, uh, the sound of gunshots and enemies gets drowned out into the distance in favour of a song called The Man I Love, Jewel Sessions, Echo Remix. Uh, being a licensed song, I unfortunately can't play much of it on here on YouTube, but here's a couple of seconds because I'm feeling rebellious. This moment is somber, it's ambient, it's dreamlike, it's visceral, it's, it's late night lo-fi, it's one of the more intense shootouts in the game, and it all comes together beautifully. It reminded me of some of the stuff Max Payne 3 did later with music, or the opera scene in Quantum of Solace. It captures this strong, atmospheric, emotional core that just hits you, even when the rest of the game fails to get close to doing so through any other avenue. And weirdly, the game never does this again. It's just this two minute patch of brilliance out of nowhere. Another level I'm fond of is the following level named Carrier, which replaces the frigate level from the original. Uh, it also has great atmosphere with a cityscape and a sunset and a corporate crowd gathering for an arms fair that inevitably gets attacked. 
Uh, it's fun shooting through a great looking contemporary location and eventually onto the boat itself. Nothing as transcendent as that part in the nightclub, but it feels very Bond. Which can't at all be said for the later tank level, which feels like something out of a post-apocalyptic hellscape. Like, this is meant to be St. Petersburg, but it's entirely under construction, I guess, and glowing gold on the PS3 360 port, and in a game that normally struggles with being immediately recognizable as a Bond game, this level in particular is so far removed from Bond. It, it looks like Halo 2's Earth as you roll through it locking onto things with missiles and shooting your machine gun. It, it's, it's a really weird five minutes. It marks a real drop in quality for the game too. It happens about two thirds through and after it the levels are just so bland and aren't as close to as thoughtful or Bondian as Nightclub or Carrier were. Uh, you shoot through some of St. Petersburg, which again looks like Halo 2, and if you were looking forward to seeing how the train level was remade, too bad, it's just four stopped carriages. Uh, Jungle is a series of annoying forced stealth sections followed by a quick time event fight with Xenia, and Cradle is fine until an extremely frustrating boss fight with Alec on the harder difficulties that ends with another quick time event. The other levels before the tank are generally well crafted, but none of them are quite as special as Nightclub or Carrier. And Frankly, I'm sure it's been quite easy for you to get a sense of what this game is like just by watching my footage. It's, it's simple, it's decent fun most of the time, it's a Bondian take on Call of Duty with more old school sensibilities, it's highs usually aren't super high, it's lows aren't super low, and on its own merits, it's a cool cinematic shooter. Uh, on the Wii that was something of a treat, but it wasn't on the consoles it was ported to. Clearly this doesn't live up to the original's mythos, but you wouldn't expect it to. That said, I wish this game did more to stick its head above the crowd, and it fails to reimagine either the movie or the game in an inspired, interesting, or bold way. It, it indecisively sits right in between the game and the movie, meaninglessly drawing from both, and failing to really please fans of either. It'll recreate scenes from the film in worse ways with duller characters, and it'll recreate scenes from the game in half-committed ways, and at times it's Call of Duty but a bit slower or it's the original N64 game but without the sense of freedom, it, it never commits to a direction, meandering in this awkward in-between without quite pinning something it can truly excel at. Uh, whether you're a fan of the film or a fan of the movie or unfamiliar with either or only vaguely remember enjoying the old GoldenEye stuff, which I imagine is probably most of you, You'll probably enjoy this remake for what it is, but it doesn't do a lot to reach beyond its good not great status. Except for that two minutes in the nightclub. What we know about the Activision era Bond games is that both Activision and the Bond license holders have been oppressively difficult to work with. Whether it's been Treyarch with Quantum or Bizarre with Bloodstone, the leads behind these Bond games have openly expressed their frustrations with how restrictive working on them was, whether it's been publicly or with my personal conversations with some of them. GoldenEye had the added layer of Nintendo's involvement, who were the ones that published the original Nintendo 64 game and cancelled Rare's Xbox 360 remake of it, according to its developers. Now, this is all speculation, but if Nintendo still had or has that power over the game, then there's a fair chance that they're the reason this remake isn't too similar to the original. I, I wonder if Activision and Nintendo had to come to an agreement just to get that opening area of the dam level to look the same. So Activision, Bond's license holders, and probably Nintendo all in some way had their fingers in the pie, and on top of that Eurocom had the added pressure of remaking an all time classic game on what was probably a shorter than ideal time frame after the project fell through the hands of another developer, and they had to develop a game mimicking the scale and style of Call of Duty on the underpowered Wii. It's kind of no wonder this game ended up being pushed and pulled in the ways it did. To repeat myself this was an uphill battle from any angle you look at it. Which brings us to the multiplayer, what Goldeneye was mainly remembered for, and four player split screen makes a return but it feels like the maps were designed for the up to eight player online multiplayer mode because they're quite large for just four players, and with the COD loadouts and the ranks and the progression systems this game was definitely designed as an online game first. 
Activision shut down the servers in 2018, but thankfully you are still able to play it thanks to the fanbase figuring out a way to hack a debug server that was still left in the Wii game's code, and thanks to a very welcoming Discord community that still plays the game on the regular. Uh, a link to the Discord is in the description. If you're interested, I do recommend checking it out because everyone there is lovely and you can play this on Dolphin if you like. It shouldn't come as a surprise that this is, again, Call of Duty. Three words that I've said so much that they're losing meaning, but being Call of Duty, it's quite fun, even if I was getting stomped by veterans the whole time. Uh, it differentiates itself by having some goofy, fun game modes alongside the classics like Golden Gun or Hero Mode, where one player on each team plays as a powerful hero that their teammates have to protect. Uh, it's fun and it leans away from a lot of the cheap kill stuff like killstreak abilities to feel more like a pure shooter. GoldenEye Reloaded on PS3 and 360 was virtually dead after its first year, but the Wii game remarkably was active all the way up until it shut down in 2018, and it was one of the most active non-Nintendo online games on the Wii. With the handful of hours I played of it for this video, I obviously can't fully speak to the last decade of multiplayer shenanigans that were had here, so after researching and speaking with a lot of long-term fans of the game, I'll try my best to paint a picture of just what this game meant to them and why it had and still has to an extent such staying power. The game FAQ's GoldenEye Wii message board was one of the most active Wii boards on the site, I believe only being beaten by Mario Kart and Super Smash, and it now exists as this wonderful early 2010s time capsule. Over 2200 pages of threads argue about who's the best player of all time and have people organizing clans and 1v1s and recording clan fights and there's people always accusing each other of hacking, which was apparently a big problem back in the day. Uh, this community supposedly had hundreds of active clans during its prime and you could always refresh the forum to see new posts. When I asked OG player proudly hated what the draw card of Goldeneye was, they had this to say. What made the game fun, however, was its motion detection game mechanic. By playing with the Wii remote, your cursor was no longer fixed to the center of your screen, allowing you to aim and shoot anywhere within your field of view. Being more of a competitive player myself, I found this to be more rewarding by mastering the art of aiming with the Wii remote rather than using a standard controller stick. To this day, I've never played another FPS that had a skill gap as high as Goldeneye had. To compete with the best players, using a Wii remote is a must. It surprised me that most players agreed that the Wii Remote was the best way to play. Uh, another user named Damutterbird echoed these sentiments and had this to say. Goldeneye is complex in its simplicity. In a way, Goldeneye is like chess. Although chess seems very simple, it can be mastered to an extremely high degree. Subconsciously, you count how many bullets your opponent has, how many you have, where everyone is positioned, which players are killing and being killed, where they are heading, where they will respawn when you kill them, what weapons and gadgets they are using, player strengths to avoid and weaknesses to exploit, etc. Uh, Goldeneye is a mind game as much as anything, and that's partly why it's so fun. It throws out needless complexity and focuses on the experience, and with the new servers, the experience is even better than before. This will always be my favorite game. Those new servers are the rebalanced modded servers, and obviously I'm chatting to those who still love the game to this day, and not those who played it twice and forgot about it, so there's plenty of bias here, but it does answer why Goldeneye had such sustained popularity. It was an elegant game with a high skill ceiling, a slow progression grind, and an active community. Uh, notably, I noticed a lot of players started young with the game as it was a Call of Duty alternative on Wii with a lower parental rating, but the fact that it maintained a vibrant player base for so long proves it was more than just a dollar store cod, at least when it comes to the multiplayer. Being late to the party, I'll never fully understand its successes. It's, it's hard for me to personally see it as more than a simple fun shooter, but it does seem like a good one at that. And when teasing this video, commenters and repliers came out of the woodworks to share their love for this online mode too. Which about wraps up the Activision GoldenEye remake package. Uh, there's a mode in Reloaded called MI6 Ops, which is just thrown together single player challenge missions set on the multiplayer maps, 
And the hardest difficulty in the campaign doesn't have regenerating health where you instead pick up armor, which is kind of interesting, but it also sort of feels like an afterthought. Uh, and otherwise, what you see is what you get here. Uh, this GoldenEye remake is a game that was always going to be a victim of its own circumstance. And at least when it comes to the single player, it asks you if a remake of a classic that is only good is good enough. I'm split on how I want to end this video. I, I want to call this a solid but fun game, but I also want to call it another face in the crowd. I have complicated feelings about this version of GoldenEye because ultimately it's both. Hello, welcome to the final section of the video. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, do all the stuff that the YouTube algorithm likes, like like and dislike, because dislikes don't mean anything anymore, I guess. I don't know, do all that stuff. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I want to thank everyone from that uh, GoldenEye online multiplayer Discord server, uh, particularly everyone who played with me and and Archer and Demutterbird and Ida Yellow and Proudly Hated. Thank you all so much for being so accommodating. Um, I encourage anyone who's listening to go check that server out, go play some games with them. It's it's a neat little thing. Um, and yeah, there's, there's one more Activision 007 game to cover called 007 Legends, which those of you who know about it know that it is uh, famously terrible. It is infamous for being terrible. Um, so that'll be fun. We'll get around to that someday. Uh, and now I want to thank my patrons. One of the last times, maybe even the last time, I'll be uh, reading them out. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of my wonderful, wonderful patrons. Thank you to the patrons coming up on the screen. And a special thank you to my $5 patrons, Alex Austin, Analog Man, Andrew Ferguson, Dominant Eye, uh, Anthony Gallagher, Anthony Valiant, Aradina Varin, Big J, Boggy Online, Bry, Cannondorf, CD Rom Fossil, Chu Cannon, Cody Dockham, Connor McWelch, Connor Salinas, Dan Pierce, Daniel Gold, Dingo Dangle, Dominic Chikoki, Dope Pants, Dr. Daniel 316, uh, Evil Chicken, Felipe Megales, Gary Pay, Hazardous, Kirby, Ian Lockhart. I've already run out of things I want to make Mini Me say beyond bum. Jay Gulls, Kane Ramsey, Kayla, uh, Labcat, Lucas Racevic, Major1940, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Michael Brennan, Mini Me Likes Nondescript Patron Names, Mr. Scumbag Movies, got him, <laughs> bloody got him, mate, Mr. Sunday Movies, Mustache Duct Tape, Nora Featherstone, next page, uh, Oscar, PK Ponky Kong, Patrick Kirst, Peter Soros, Puix, Plague, Riddlin for Kids, Robbie Grieg, uh, Ruth Knappman, Sam King, Sam Liss, Scott Hazlitt, Skyd Panthera, Sour Pears, Spoofer, Tio, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Last Great Opium Den, Tiksh, Tim Linden, Trevor Corbin, uh, Trixie Emerson, Venetian Red, Wastelander 997, Wayne is Boss, Zindictive, and Yams. Thank you all for being wonderful patrons of mine. Uh, thank you all for watching, if you're still watching or listening or whatever you're doing. And I'll see you all in the next video, hopefully one more before the year's end. If not, Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, all that stuff.